Uh, good morning, my name is Jeff Ballard, and this is the Cape Esperance, the misunderstood victory of Admiral Norman Scott. In the early morning hours of August 9th, 1942, the joint American Australian task force that was screening the amphibious landings on Guadalcanal and Tulagi in the Southern Solomons was surprised and thoroughly defeated by a numerically inferior Japanese force. The loss of life was unprecedented. It was the worst defeat in the United States Navy's history and went down in the history books as the Battle of Sabo Island. Uh, in this battle, the Japanese sank three heavy cruisers, damaged a fourth, and sank one light cruiser. And these were the first four of many ships that were laid to rest on the bottom of the body of water which became known as uh, Iron Bottom Sound because the accumulation of shipwrecks and, and iron caused ship's compass needles to weigh quiver as ships passed over the uh, wrecks. Uh, if you were to drain the ocean, this is approximately what the sound would look like. It is the graveyard of thousands of American uh, uh, sailors and Japanese sailors as well and more than four dozen shipwrecks. So 60 days later on October the 12th, which by the way was 76 years ago yesterday, our Rear Admiral Norman Scott and his task force of cruisers and destroyers flipped the script on the Japanese and defeated a decimated, a surprised Japanese force. Or did they? Um, the, one of the amazing things about the battle was that, uh, that, Sa that Scott lost only a single destroyer that day. Uh, and this battle would go down in history as the Battle of Cape Esperance, uh, which was the name for the northernmost point on the island of Guadalcanal. Um, so, was this a, was this an, was Cape Esperance an overwhelming victory? Well, Scott's commanders thought so. They put their heads together and they decided that it, they had sunk uh, three cruisers and five destroyers. So now the question is, was the defeat in August an aberration? Well, uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz, who was the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, he thought so when he wrote, our forces, our light forces are equal to or better than theirs. And that, another question, were the tactics that, that, um, that Scott used, was that the, the answer to the Navy's uh, problems? Well, South, Com South Pacific commanders thought so and repeated Scott's tactics again and again and again and again and again in 1942 and in 1943, but never achieved the same results. So I'm gonna ask the question, was uh, the Battle of Cape Esperance an unqualified victory? I don't believe that it was. In fact, I think in the long run, it did more harm than good and I think that it indirectly uh, uh, resulted in the loss of more than a dozen ships, the deaths of hundreds of sailors, including Scots. So that's the, what I'd like to talk about this morning. Uh, let's unpack this a little bit, get a little bit of uh, historical context. So the root cause of all of the activities in the South Pacific in the, in the fall and winter of 1942, and, and by all the activities, I mean there was five major naval surface engagements, the second and third carrier battles of the war, and land and sea battle, uh, I'm sorry, land and air battles, too numerous to mention here. The root cause of all of this activity was the 1st Marines Division landing on Guadalcanal and Tulagi Islands on August the 7th. Hoorah. 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 <laughs> Their objective was to capture an airfield that the Japanese were constructing. Had the Japanese been able to uh, finish construction of this airfield then, they would have been able to sortie two engine bombers down into the Coral Sea, interdicting supplies from the United States to Australia. Uh, at, at this point in, in March of 1942, the Australians were, were very concerned that uh, their northern coast would be invaded by, by the Japanese. 
Uh, so uh, Admiral, our Admiral uh, Ernest King had initially selected Tulagi as the point of the uh, uh, initial landings, but when he discovered that the Japanese were constructing an airfield then, uh, the, la the landings on Guadalcanal then became the primary objective of this phase of what was known as Operation Watchtower. Um, so as I mentioned, the uh, 1st Marine Division landed on uh, Guadalcanal and Tulagi Islands on August the 7th. The Imperial Japanese Army was quick to react. They tried on two occasions to, uh, uh, to not only recapture the airfield, but to eject the, the Marines entirely from the island of Guadalcanal. The first was at the Battle of the Tenaru River on August 21st. Uh, the second was at the Battle of Bloody Ridge on the 13th, 12th through the 14th of September. Uh, both of these, there was a tremendous number of losses on the Japanese side. <laughs> they were ineffective in the sense that they amounted to little more than sort of uncoordinated bonsai charges. Um, and, they, and this was in the face of the Marines' heavy weapons, uh, machine guns, and artillery. The Imperial Navy, however, was slow to react. Um, the, the Imperial Navy's intelligence estimates said that there was only about 2,000 Marines on the island, and it was their intention to withdraw as soon as they had uh, uh, destroyed the airfield, sort of a, a raid like they had done previously at on Macon. Uh, they were wrong. <laughs> the Marines landed in force. There was five and a half times that number, 11,000 Marines, and, and they were there to stay. Uh, the, the, uh, as I mentioned, the Imperial Navy did uh, force the, the, battle, uh, the Battle of the Eastern Solomons on the 22nd through the 25th of August. It was a tactical victory for the Japanese because uh, they damaged the aircraft carrier Yorktown. And uh, aircraft, at the time, aircraft carriers were very rare in the Pacific, <laughs> <laughs> so every one of them counted. Uh, the, the Americans were, succeeded in sinking the Lycario Ryujo, which uh, the Japanese actually dangled out there as bait. So Americans took the bait, sank, sank the Lycario. Uh, but it was, a, it was a strategic victory for the United States because they uh, foiled the Japanese plan to draw the Pacific Fleet into the decisive battle of the war that they so wanted to, uh, to, uh, to win, which would then drive the Allies to the negotiating table. Okay. So during this period of time, uh, August through September, uh, a very regular cycle developed uh, in, in, in the South Pacific. The Japanese basically owned the night. Mm, they succeeded time and time and time again in reinforcing Guadalcanal to the tune of about 6,000 troops. They did this uh, in convoys that they si sailed down the slot, which was the New Georgia Sound, which was that space between the two parallel island chains that make up the Solomon Islands. Uh, Periodically, uh, fast destroyers and bar fleets of small barges, uh, uh, cruisers with troops embarked would deposit troops on Guadalcanal, and then they would sail down the, co the north coast of Guadalcanal to the Lunga Plain where the Marines were constructing the airfield and bombard them. Uh, in fact, a lot of oftentimes submarines would surface in the Savo Sound and bombard the uh, Marines with their deck guns. Their intention being to obviously to kill the Marines, uh, but also to uh, disrupt the construction of the airfield or put the airfield out of action. Because when the sun rose, <laughs> the, the Navy then uh, asserted local air superiority over the, over the Solomon Islands, and, um, and Japanese traffic departed. So uh, the, during the same period of time, however, the Marines received virtually no, tro or no troops and very, very few supplies. In fact, the Marines were on half rations from the first day of, of the invasion. And at one point, uh, General Vandergrift, who was the commander of the 1st Marine Division, uh, calculated that he had less than 12 days uh, supply of ammunition. <coughs> That situation began to change in October. <clears throat> the uh, commander-in-chief of the South Pacific Fleet, 
Um, uh, Admiral Robert, Vice Admiral Robert Gormley believed that he had sufficient troops in the theater to interdict the Japanese uh, resupply of Guadalcanal and also to reinforce the Marines for the very first time. He had three uh, task forces available to him. The first was built around the aircraft carrier Hornet. Uh, the second built around the battleships, the new fast battleships, Washington and South Dakota. And the third was Scott's striking force, which consisted of, it was Task Force 64, which consisted of uh, the heavy cruisers San Francisco, Salt Lake City, the light cruisers Juno and Boise, and five destroyers with Destroyer Squadron 12, which was uh, commanded by uh, Commander Robert Tobin. Uh, Scott also, or I'm sorry, Gormley also had troops with which to, to uh, reinforce uh, Vandergrift. He had available to him the 7th Marine Regiment and also the 164th Infantry Regiment of the AmeriCal Division. So, on October the 7th, Scott sortied from Espiritu Santo and the New Hebrides, arriving at Rennell Island, which is south of Guadalcanal, on the 8th, at which time he conducted gunnery and anti-aircraft practices. And then he loitered for two days in this general vicinity, circulating between point A and point C, in the hopes that the Allied aerial reconnaissance would reveal a Japanese Tokyo Express. On the 9th and the 10th, it did not. However, on the 11th, a B-17 from Espiritu Santo spotted a force which it described as two large and six small ships. The B-17 had actually discovered the reinforcement group of uh, Rear Admiral um, Joshima's reinforcement group who had uh, and his force was built around the uh, seaplane tenders and two seaplane tenders and six destroyer transports who had embarked 700 troops of the Japanese second division a lot of their heavy equipment some of their artillery and even uh, tanks <clears throat> what the B-17 did not discover was that trailing Joshima by several hundred miles but on the same course and speed was a second task force, the uh, Admiral Aritomo Gato's bombardment group. Gato's uh, mission was to obviously to bombard Henderson Field that night to knock the airfield out of action so that the next morning the Cactus aircraft, the, the, the uh, Guadalcanal Canal was uh, nicknamed um, Cactus. It would knock the Cactus Air Force out of commission so that Joshima could escape up the slot the next morning, make it to Rabaul without be fear of being um, harassed by American planes. So, <clears throat> at this point, Scott be begins to develop a plan. He's, fair, he's fairly certain that the two large and six small ships are uh, two cruisers and six uh, des destroyer transports who are going to deposit their troops on the north coast of Guadalcanal. Based on the course and speed, he expects them to arrive a little bit before midnight. Uh, in fact, uh, Joshima would later increase speed and arrive on the island earlier. Uh, so then at, let me see, at 4 o'clock he begins preparing his uh, ships for battle. This uh, entails giving the crew meals and once meals were served and cleaned up then the galley tables then became, would become the makeshift operating theaters once the ships went into combat and there were injuries. Uh, he also ordered all the ships to jettison their flammables. This was the uh, paint. Um, Scott earlier that day had asked each one of the cruiser uh, the, the cruisers to fly off all of their cruiser float planes except one so he flew those planes off so that the uh, the planes and their aviation gasoline would not be a, a, a fire hazard during combat but he asked each one of his destroyers or cruisers to retain one float plane at sunset um, a second B-17 spotted 
Joshima and confirmed its course and speed. Again, Scott now is certain that they're going to arrive on Guadalcanal a little bit after midnight. Okay, uh, so then at, mid at, uh, at sunset, Scott asked each of his cruisers to launch their float planes. San Francisco's plane goes off normally. Uh, Helena's seaplane, Hel actually Helena claims to have never received the message via uh, voice radio, which was called TBS, the talk between ships, high, a very uh, short range radio. So Helena claims that he never got the, the message and actually he just jettisons its plane into the, into the water so, so that it wouldn't be a fire hazard. Uh, Salt Lake City's plane crashes on takeoff and bursts into flames. <clears throat> now, Scott is fairly certain that his force has been revealed. Um, the, the accident occurred here on the, on the southern coast of Guadalcanal, and the reality is that nobody is looking in that direction. Obviously, there's a very high mountain ridge of high mountains here. There's almost nobody is on this side of the island. All the Japanese are on the, the, uh, the north uh, west portion of the island, and they're all looking into the uh, to the Savo Sound. Nobody sees the burning plane. 